In this lecture, we're looking at Calvin from the time of his exile from Geneva until the time when he returned to lead the Reformation there for the remainder of his life. And we pick up with Calvin and Pharaoh leaving from Geneva, really with their tail between their legs. They thought that they had been in the right. They thought that they had the other Swiss reformers behind them. But what they soon found out is that they were not behind them. But in fact, the majority of the folks who ran the Swiss Reformation found them to be a little more than a nuisance. They found that their actual perspective, the things that they had applied themselves to in Geneva, had made the matter worse. Since the Reformation was only newly begun in Geneva, their new hostilities and the controversies that they provoked may have managed, at least it was believed at the time, to propel Geneva back into the arms of the Catholic Church. Well, for a period of time, Calvin in particular travels back and forth between the cities of Bern and Basel. Neither of these cities was going to be a permanent residence. Calvin was really sort of searching for what he was going to become now that he had given up the role of being a leader of a reformed city. And these really are trying times for Calvin. He just simply is not sure what to make of all of this. He consoled himself with the fact that he had never wanted to be a reformer in the first place. Well, during this time of intermittent exile, the reformers of the Swiss regions, in particular Bützer in Strasbourg and Bullinger in Zurich, argued that Calvin and Farrell needed to be separated. The relationships between these two men, it seemed, was for the worst. Better to separate them, let them go their separate ways, let them learn patience and humility, rather than keep the two of them together and stoke up more controversy down the line. Well, almost immediately, Farrell is sent off from Calvin's presence, and he takes up a post as pastor at Neuchâtel. And you'll remember from our last lecture that Farrell had actually begun the Reformation there. And so their calling of him to be their pastor made a great deal of sense for Neuchâtel. Bootser and others applauded this decision, though, because it essentially separated Calvin from the man who made him so hot-blooded. Well, what to do with Calvin now? Well, again, into the fray steps Bootser. Bootser invites Calvin up to the city of Strasbourg to live there and to serve there, both as a teacher and as a temporary preacher from time to time, leading a congregation. But the ulterior motive, obviously, was that Bootser wanted to keep an eye on Calvin. Well, what was Calvin's life like at the city of Strasbourg? Well, there are a number of features, personal as well as theological, that begin to shape Calvin's life during his stay there with Bootser. We've already mentioned that Bootser gives Calvin free reign to serve a church there locally, as well as to, in part, at times, preach. Well, the issue in Strasbourg was not the same as it was in Geneva. Strasbourg was its own city. It had its own power base. It officially answered to the Holy Roman Empire. But as a result of a number of good actions that they had done on behalf of the empire, on behalf of Charles, Strasbourg was given the privilege to be labeled an independent city, and it was trusted to govern much of itself on its own. And so the issues that Calvin and Farrell faced in Geneva, where they wanted to affect the Reformation and bring change about, and where they wanted to be the ones who called the shots, was simply not the issue in Strasbourg. Because while Geneva had resisted this, not only because it was a bit reticent to allow so much power to the foreigners, but also because it answered to the city of Bern, that resistance that Calvin experienced in Geneva, he did not experience in the city of Strasbourg. Bootser had more or less an iron grip on the city, and he was trusted because he was at the height of his powers at this point in his life during the Reformation to lead the church in whatever way that he saw fit by and large. And we can cover the personal side of Calvin in Strasbourg first. One of the things that actually happens for Calvin is he needs to find a place to live when he arrives. And for a period of time, very short period of time, but for a number of weeks and months, Calvin actually lived in Bootser's home. Bootser had this magnanimous, hospitable spirit about him. He wanted Calvin to be with him. He wanted Calvin to be around him. And so when he arrived, Bootser gave him lodging in his own house. Not long after, though, a home is eventually found for Calvin, and it was more or less next door. In fact, the homes of Bootser and Calvin shared a garden together. And though we don't have a lot of great detail in the same way that we have with Luther and the table talk, we do know that the two would spend many a night together, 
There are lots of chance moments bumping into each other, and Butsu really becomes the older brother during this. And there's an analogy that's used by a recent biography of Calvin that I think is pretty fitting, and it will help us understand what Calvin is going through. Calvin, of course, comes onto the scene in the Swiss regions a bit late. He was also relatively without connections when he arrived there. Well, this recent biography by Bruce Gordon says that if you look at the people that Calvin initially had engagement with, they really kind of form a familial knot of people that are connected with him. He argues that Farrell is kind of the crazy uncle, the man who inspires Calvin and for whom Calvin has a great deal of loyalty. But Calvin is not going to sell himself out for the sake of following Farrell. He's too much of his own man. So Farrell is the uncle. Bullinger, Gordon argues, is kind of a cousin. Something of a distant cousin, really. They're friendly, they're cordial. They will disagree on a number of fronts, particularly related to the Eucharist, but they will be friendly. Melanchthon is the school friend. A man of his years, a man who is, like Calvin, the young man in a Reformation context of a great deal of older men. Both precocious, both really savants and prodigies, you might say, at exegesis, language, and writing. Beza, who we really haven't seen much of yet, who will come on the scene later in Calvin's life in Geneva, becomes something of a son for Calvin. But in the end, it's Butzer who forms the father figure for Calvin. Butzer is a bit older, roughly the same age as Luther, and Calvin not really having a father figure growing up in terms of his Protestant theology. You have to remember he was sent off to school and never really returned for any significant period of time to the city of Noyon. Calvin had never really been mentored or shepherded. He'd never had a father figure during his times in either Paris or in Geneva. And Butzer finally fills that void and becomes his first real discipler. And so Calvin really was nourished in the home of Butzer. It wasn't just a theological friendship or a mentorship of the mind, but rather it was a familial relationship. Calvin was a precocious, single individual, somewhat lonely, somewhat isolated. And even Calvin himself said that he never spent an evening at Butzer's table without learning something. There in the midst not only of Butzer and his students, but also with Butzer's wife and his children. Well, one of the other more important things that happens to Calvin during this time is he gets married. Now, people have always loved to make fun of Calvin because he seems to have been dragged to the altar. As one writer put it, if Frenchmen are known as lovers, well, Calvin really bucks the trend here. (laughs) And this does seem to be another aspect of Butzer where he hopes that married life will somehow ground Calvin and make him more susceptible to the complexities of interpersonal life. Calvin, though, was somewhat unwilling. When the idea was first broached to him, he actually had a bit of a negative connotation about the idea of marriage itself. Not, he insists, because he's opposed to marriage, but rather he finds it somewhat irksome the way people run off and get married based on looks alone. In a letter, in fact, he actually says that the only beauty that seduces me is someone who is chaste, not too fastidious, modest, thrifty, And hopefully, he says, she will have some concern for my health. Now, people see in this, of course, the kind of curmudgeon, the cold man who wants to get married just so that he'll have somebody to take care of him. Well, a lot of that impression of Calvin actually comes from Beza. One of the great mysteries is that Beza, in his biography of Calvin, actually alleges that Calvin and his wife, Idolette, had a sexless marriage that they remained chaste all throughout their marriage, and that it was a marriage essentially for convenience, for Idolette to take care of Calvin. And we can say that not a single historian, frankly, ever since Calvin's death, has ever believed this. And this is borne out simply by the fact that Calvin actually had three children with his wife. Now, they all died, usually in infancy, and so there was no legacy of a son or a daughter with Calvin and his wife. But you don't have to be a master of logic to realize that if they have at least three children, the idea that they remain chaste in general would seem to be on rocky ground. Well, the candidates that are proposed for Calvin actually give us a little bit of a window into his personality. The first that was proposed was actually what we might call a well-arranged marriage. It was somebody that came with money and with a family that was actually quite supportive of Calvin. The potential bride, her brother, 
actually was very much in favor of Calvin's understanding of theology and of his teaching. Calvin actually rebuffed this, though. In a letter to Farrell, he actually says that he was unwilling to attach himself to too much money. One, he says, I'm a poor minister. There is not much capacity that I bring in terms of the finances to the family. And he worried that in the end, his wife would look down upon him because he brought so little in terms of their assets. He also seems to be turned off by the power play here. He doesn't really seem to want to be tied in with an important family with lots of money, no matter how much they supported him. No, in the end, Calvin chose really an unlikely woman, when you look at it from just the advantages that Calvin might have gained from marriage. He married Idolette, and the idea that they simply married out of convenience, or that this was a marriage sort of thrust upon Calvin, again, belies all the evidence. Calvin really fell head over heels for her. Now, over the course of his life, he doesn't give us much detail on their marriage. But really, that's holding Calvin up to the standard of Luther. Luther seems to give us everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of his marriage life. Calvin really holds back. He doesn't give us a whole lot. But here's the thing. Calvin chose a widow, a woman who was just into her 30s, who had two small children, and her husband had died of the plague. More importantly, though, when they had fled to Strasbourg, when they were still married, Idolette and her husband, they were Anabaptist. And if you know anything about the history of Anabaptism at this point, and remembering all the way back to the lecture we did on the 1536 Institutes, you'll recall that Anabaptism was really a mocked and a scorned perspective on the faith. There was still widespread condemnation and, in many places, persecution of Anabaptists. Now, when Idolette and her husband had arrived, before he had died, they had attended Calvin's church, and they had been won over to the Reformed faith. They had come out of their Anabaptism. But there would have been a lot of people who would have clucked their tongues at Calvin marrying a former Anabaptist. Sort of the, aha, gotcha, you really are an Anabaptist. Those types of gossipy whispers would have been prevalent, particularly amongst his enemies. And Idolette, as a widow, brought nothing in terms of assets or power to the relationship. No, they seem to have fallen in love, and Calvin was really quite smitten with her. When she dies, and she dies before he does in Geneva many years later, Calvin will say that he has lost his lifelong companion. And the little window he gives us into his soul, into his heart, tells us that he really did love her, and that their marriage, though complicated with illnesses and the complexities of being the lead reformer in a city like Geneva, their marriage was a good one. So Calvin in Strasbourg has a number of personal leaps forward. He is a mentor. He has, before he's married, a very good relationship with the Bootser household. And he gets married. And, as anyone who's married can attest, the complexities of the interpersonal relationships of marriage will certainly wake up a somewhat snobbish 30-year-old to the complexities of life. Well, what about the theological issues? What steps did Calvin take in his time in Strasbourg that prepared him and then propelled him back into the city of Geneva? Well, first and foremost, we of course need to tie in here that it is in Strasbourg where Calvin makes his major edit, the first major edit, the 1539 edit, to the Institutes. It is in Strasbourg where Calvin decides that he wants the Institutes to be more than they were originally intended to be. The other major work that Calvin pours his life into is the 1540 Romans Commentary. And Calvin on Romans really is where he's at his best exegetically. If Luther's opus, in terms of his exegesis, is the book of Galatians, Calvin's commentary on Romans is that for him. It is his opus. It is at the most pregnant moment of the development of Calvin's thinking, and it's at the time when he had the most free time, you might say, to devote himself to this research and to the writing of this commentary. And so the 1540 Romans commentary comes out during this time. Another little gem that he publishes during this time that is often overlooked is that Calvin prepared a French edition and a French translation of the sermons of Chrysostom. Now, Chrysostom was an ancient preacher. He was a phenomenal patristic writer and a theologian and a pastor. I always tell students that Chrysostom is really the Spurgeon of the ancient church. His name, in fact, Chrysostom, was an honorific that he was given. He was called the Golden Mouth One. Such a fine preacher that he was, such a homiletician, that the man, Chrysostom, 
was named Golden Mouth because of his eloquence. And Calvin prepares the sermons of Chrysostom, and he prepares them into French. Now, this signals one thing about Calvin that is unique, and it is one of his most important contributions to the Reformed world in particular, and to Protestantism in general. And that is that Calvin is a master and a deep reader and a lover of the patristic age. Calvin is not one of these Protestants, not one of these reformers, who really believes that after the book of Acts, everything goes to hell in a handbasket. For Calvin, the patristic witness is our witness. It is our heritage as well. It is not something that we consign to the flames. And people who have read the Institutes have commented repeatedly at the level sometimes to which he is willing to engage with people like Augustine and Chrysostom and others in the theology of the early four or five centuries of the church. Okay, so Calvin is mentored, he's married, and he is a bit of a changed man. So how in the world, then, does he end up back in Geneva? Well, over the course of the time that Calvin was out of Geneva, the city was still in turmoil. There was still tension between Geneva and the city of Bern, and there were tensions and pullings, influences, that were pulling Geneva back to the Duchy of Savoy. In fact, in the year 1540, just a year before Calvin is invited to return, there was actually a riot in the city of Geneva as opposing forces came to loggerheads, and this led to disorder within the city. Well, the material cause for Calvin to return actually comes from a cardinal in the Catholic Church. There was a leader in the church, a cardinal, by the name of Sadaletto. And Sadaletto was actually quite compromising and reformist, you might say. He certainly wasn't a Protestant, he wasn't about to become one, but he saw something in the Protestant message and in the Protestant revolt that he could appreciate. The issues of doctrinal conformity to the scriptures, the issue of the Renaissance papacy and the abuses of the papacy over the years were things that Sadaletto could get behind. Rather, he felt that the Protestants had simply gone too far in their reforms, and so he felt that his role as a cardinal in the church was to attempt to woo people back to the fold. Sadaletto actually himself, over time, become suspect within the Catholic Church. He had actually written a commentary on Romans, one of the main exegetical bones of contention between Catholicism and Protestantism. And that book, believe it or not, in a later year, will actually become banned as some sort of proto-Protestant-leaning text by a man who should have known better. Well, on the 26th of March in 1539, Sadaletto actually sent a letter to the city of Geneva in which he very generously and very calmly laid out a case for them to return to the Catholic fold. Essentially, his argument is, you had a go at it, you got in bed with the wrong people, you're licking your wounds now, and you've realized the error of your ways, and so why don't you return to the fold? And he sent this letter to the magistrates and the leaders in Geneva, who in turn really had no idea how to handle this document. There really was no one in Geneva who had the theological resources and tools and skill to answer this. And in terms of politics, Geneva was in no place to really negotiate its own terms, either with Protestantism or with the Catholic Church. And so, wisely, they forwarded the letter on to the city of Bern and asked for a consult as to how to reply. And it's at this point, when the other leading reformers those who were still in the city of Bern and Bullinger and Bootser himself pushed Calvin to the forefront of the reformed movement in Switzerland. Bullinger and Bootser easily could have written a response, and there were a number of others in the city of Bern who could have at least had a go at it. But it's at this point when they decide that Calvin has reconciled himself enough, that he's ingratiated himself with the other reformers, And they felt that he was in a good position, both in terms of his acumen and in terms of the time that he had on his hands, to make a good response to Sadaletto and his letter. Calvin is a bit hesitant at this point, but he is willing. This really is Calvin's bread and butter. A well-reasoned argument from a humanist man who makes the case for Catholicism was the world that Calvin had come from. And so Calvin was really in a great position, theologically and in terms of his culture, to make a good reasoned response to Sadaletto on this issue. 
And so, in September of 1539, Calvin published his letter to Sadaletto. And the work really is a masterpiece in terms of rhetoric and in terms of the arguments that Calvin employs. In fact, to this day, the letter of Sadaletto is still in print. Calvin had actually tripled the length of the letter in his response. And like a good humanist, Calvin does not get into a dogfight with Sadaletto. He does not go down point by point. He doesn't mock the man. He doesn't attempt to pants him in front of all of the European world and get a lot of cheap shots in. Calvin actually focuses the issue on the root cause of the Reformation, which is why this letter is still read even today. It's one of the few moments where we have a reformer saying, here is why we started the Reformation. Here is the issue. Not these proxy wars, not the fights about this or that, but rather this is the cause. This is the root. And for Calvin, he focuses on the nature of the church. He says the church is not what the medieval Catholic church has made it out to be. And he lays out a number of clear convictions, again, not getting pot shots, but real clear arguments as to why he and others have joined the Protestant movement. Well, in this case, it's very charming in a manner of speaking. Here was a man who had been kicked out of Geneva, a man who had gone off with his tail between his legs, who now returns and is put into the front lines by Bootser and Bullinger and others to defend the very city that had shamed him and kicked him out. And Calvin really took the task to heart, and he wrote a wonderfully important document, a book, in the context of the 16th century Reformation. In many ways, the letter to Sadaletto is Calvin's restoration to the lead rank of a reformer in the Swiss regions. Now everybody could see that the kerfuffle that had gone on in Geneva was really a problem of personality and not a problem of Calvin being a troublemaker or being a closet Anabaptist or just a renegade in all kinds of different ways. Calvin now is shown to be magnanimous, he defends the city, and he defends the Reformation. And, lo and behold, the city, now in need of real strong theological defense and realizing its weakness both in terms of the church and the Reformation and realizing its weakness in terms of its relationship to the other Swiss cities in the Reformed movement, began to ask about for someone who would come to their aid, someone who would come and take up residence there in Geneva. And yet again, it's Bootser and Bullinger and the other senior leaders of the Reformed movement who put Calvin forward as the man to lead the charge. Now, Calvin has cold feet about this. He actually says a few scathing things. He says, he would not take it on if his life were at stake. But in the end, wiser heads prevail, and Calvin is restored to Geneva, and he is recalled. Okay, that's it. Next, we're going to be looking at Calvin's return to Geneva in the context of the beginning of the Reformation there. Mm-hmm.